rescued my life And I'm never going back My response is Hallelujah Hallelujah, glory to Jesus. Amen. Yes, Lord.
the God of awesome wonders, I've tasted of your power. Holy shit, Yanu, you have shown me so much mercy, much more than I deserve. The God of awesome wonders. Come on, you can clap a little bit louder. You can even scream and you can shout. Release a shout unto the Lord this morning. He's been faithful. He's been wonderful. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. There's nothing like your presence, Lord. All I want is to be with you. There's nothing like your presence, Lord. All I want is to be with you. There's nothing like your presence, Lord. All I want is to be with you. There's nothing like your presence, Lord. All I want is to be with you. Oh, there's nothing like, come on. There's nothing like your presence. All I want is to worship. All I want is to worship you. There's nothing like your presence, Lord. All I want is to worship you. Nothing like your presence, Lord. All we want, all I want is to worship you. There's nothing like your presence, Lord. All I want is to worship you. Come on, worship him, worship him, worship him. All we want to do is worship, worship, worship.
access to the Holy of Holies, God. Rest on your people today, God. church this morning. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us, come rest on us, calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me, calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving I'm here and I know you will feel me Oh, you show up every time You show up every time Come on, as the Spirit As the Spirit was moving over the water Spirit come move over us Come rest on us Come rest on us Rest on as the spirit, as the spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Yeah. Come rest on us. Can you declare it? Come, come on. on, as the spirit, as the spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Yeah. Oh 
Close your eyes, let the Spirit of the Living God hover over us today. Let Him come and speak on your circumstances. Let Him bring light into every area of darkness. As the Spirit of moving over the water, Spirit come God, over us. God, move over us today. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the spirit was moving over the water, spirit come move over yes. us. Yes, come rest on us. Spirit of God, we ask come you to rest on us. And rest upon us. As the spirit God. was moving over the water, the spirit come spirit move God. over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the spirit was moving over the water, the spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the spirit was moving over the water, the spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Since fire and wind and fire and wind come and do it again. Open up the gates and heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. fire and fire and wind. Come and do it again. Open up the gates and heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Fire, fire. Fire and wind. Come and do it again. Open up the gates and heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Bring the fire, fire and wind. Come and do it again. Open up the gates and heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Calm down, calm down, calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. your people this morning we thank you God let your voice be the strongest voices the strongest voices in the earth in our lives God spirit of the living God you're doing surgery in our hearts this morning father God we get out of our way for you to come and do what you want to do spirit of the living God we thank you mighty king for the heaviness of your presence in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you for your presence in our midst. 
We'll have our offerings this morning. I'd like we go into the book of First Corinthians. Thank you, Jesus. First Cor Second Corinthians, excuse me, nine six to eight. Welcome everybody. I just want we stay in this atmosphere of the Spirit of God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We're gonna give our tithes and our offerings. Second Corinthians nine six to eight. The Bible says, "Remember this: a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves." A person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Amen. Hallelujah. God is saying we are farmers this morning in the house of God. Amen. Good to see all of you, all of you, all of you. The Passion Translation says this thing. Let giving flow let giving flow from your heart. Amen? Not from, not from a sense of religious du duty. Let giving flow from your heart, from a generous heart. Not from a sense of religious duty. And I believe that's where God wants each one of us to get to that place. Amen? When we come to Christ, I was thinking about it. When you come to Christ... You hear the word of God and you start saying, I need to give because my Bible so, says so. Amen? Which is a good way of giving because you are obeying to the word of God. Amen? I need to give because my Bible says so. Then you start giving. Amen? You're giving because it's a commandment. And then you get to the next level because some of us, sometimes it's hard to give. We want to look at what, what's in it for me. I need to give, but I need to know what's in it for me. Praise the Lord, people. And God understands our heart. He said, if you sow generously, you will reap generously. Amen? But God wants us to go to the next level. He say, let giving, generous giving flow from your heart. It has nothing to do what you get out of it. Nothing to do if it, you know, it's a commandment or not. Amen? It's a part of your nature because God is a giver. Amen? And then you get to a place when you start realizing how much God loves you so much. And you start saying, I must give. I need to give back to this God who's done so much for me. Amen? That's a heart of gratitude. I cannot, like King David, I cannot go in the house of God empty-handed. That's a heart that realizes, no, I cannot. I have to give back. I need to contribute. I can't be a taker. I need to be a giver. Amen? You know, it's not about any more profiting. It's about me being a part of the bigger picture, seeing what God has given me and me wanting to contribute back into his kingdom of God. Amen? And then you get to a place where you say, I can't wait to give. Giving is who I am. And that's what God is calling us in the New Testament. Don't give out of a religious duty. When you give your 10%, don't do it out of religious duty. When you give your offering, don't give it out of religious duty. But from a heart that is full of generosity. Let giving flow from your heart. Amen? And then you get to a level like Christ. Where you say, God, I need to be a blessing. That's who I am. Amen? I need to find every opportunity to give. And that's where God wants us to be, as a church, as the body of Christ. God, I can't wait. Give me some more so I can give. And that's what God spoke to Abraham. Say, I'll make you a bless. You'll be blessed so you can be a blessing. Now when you give, God, no, bless me so I can be a blessing. Now I know my very nature is to be a blessing Wherever I go. So who I am has to be a blessing. Amen. Now you have gone into the very nature, heart, purpose of God for us believers. I'm blessed to be a blessing. 
I'm blessed to be a blessing. And today as we give, I want we give in faith to become that kind of people. Amen. When I don't give because I have to, it's a commandment. When I don't give because something is in it for me. Amen. I don't give because, you know, I got to give back somehow, feel out of guilt. God said, let's generosity come out of your heart. Let be like Jesus, Abraham, blessed to be a blessing. Hallelujah. We can give, bring your tithes and your offering. God bless you all. We'll pray. And listen to me, people of God. Sometimes people are, people are like, yeah, but why always give to church? We can give to the poor. There's no comparison. Each place has a place in his, in his kingdom. Amen? My biggest place of giving is in the house of God. You know why? That's where I get fed. That's where I get empowered. That's where I get the very life of God. Amen? I must contribute. I must give. I have to be blessed. As I'm being blessed by the word of God, I give back. I give back. That's who I am. Generosity must flow from this heart of mine. That's the Christ-like giving. Let's not let the philosophies of this world stay, put us away from the ways of the kingdom. The Bible says put God first and his kingdom and everything will be added to you. One thing does not re replace the other. Both walk hand in hand. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's rise up. We're going to pray. And we're going to thank God that he's turning our hearts into becoming those who are blessed to be a blessing. That God will give us a revelation of who we are. I'm a blessing. I've been blessed and I'll be blessed to be a blessing. God, whatever you give me, I know and I'm an agent of blessing in every place that I go. Father God, we give you praise. We thank you for each giver. God, turn our heart like you say. Let giving and generosity flow from our heart. Not from out of religious duty, but an understanding of who we are as your sons and daughters. Father God, that wherever we are, we know we are a blessing. We walk to be a blessing. That that's our status, mighty God. Thank you, Lord. God, we want to advance your kingdom. We want to advance your work. Father God, bless this house. Bless each giver so that they can give, so we can continue to preach the gospel. So that we can do even more for your glory, mighty God. So that we can advance your work. We thank you, Lord. Because this this good news of the gospel shall and must preach to the ends of the earth, God. And we want Cross Point as an organization to be a vehicle to preach the good news of the kingdom wherever we are, in whatever we do, God. So bless this house. Bless each family, mighty God. Let them be instrument and agent of blessing that wherever they go, the generous heart will flow from their heart, mighty God. We give you all the glory. We thank you, mighty God. Continue to provide and make a way for each one of us, Jesus. Establish our path so that we can be all that you have called us to be. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray today. Hallelujah. God bless you. And let's give generously. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Welcome, Apostle. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody, are you happy to be in the house of the Lord? Is somebody happy to be in the house of the Lord? Before you begin to be, put a hold right now on your giving. Wait, wait a minute. Don't, don't begin to give. Wait first. I want to add a little notch on what she was speaking, first of all. To build something within you. Add it to what she said. When I sat down there and she began to talk about a give, as God gave unto you, the Spirit of God began to speak to me in my heart. And this verse dropped in my spirit from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3 to 5. If the people can project that for us. It says that they gave as much as they were able, comma, and even beyond their ability, period. Entirely on their own. 
No promise of a prophetic word. No promise that you're going to have a new house or buy a car. Nobody prophesied anything. There was no trade. Give, then you will receive the, the, work, the house. We, are you with me? Are you with me? Verse 4. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege. Did you see that word there? Can you say it? Privilege. It's a privilege to give. Of sharing in the service of the Lord's people. Last one. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first. Are you catching this? What did they give the money first? Did they give the money first? Did they give the offering first? Did they give the tithe first? What did they give first? They gave themselves first. Magadabosha. Listen to me. I will close it right now. She did the offering here. You heard it. The seed was planted. But I'm adding in the same spirit. Until you are consecrated to God, giving will be a burden to you. If you're feeling burden of giving right now, your consecration is questionable. It's simple. Until you give yourself first to the Lord, only then, poor like the Macedonian church, you can give them. If you are not consecrated fully, if your work with God is half and half, if it's one song here, one song there, what can I get? Then when we say, give your tithe and your offering, burden is visiting. This is one of the greatest key to understand what is first in your life. When giving became a delight, Sarabo Shandaya, become a joy, not by coercion or manipulation or promise of a prophetic word or promise of a new house, of a car, or you being married until you understand that you are given unto God fully because he has purchased you not with gold and silver but, but with precious blood. When we mention giving, your heart tremble. When we mention giving, offenses visiting. When we mention free giving, you want to run away. When we mention giving, you look at the neighbor to give, but not you. When you mention giving, you begin to look at your own problem. When you mention giving, you begin to look at your own bills. When you mention giving, you begin to look at your own poverty. But when you're consecrated, one dollar or none, two dollars or two thousand, when we mention giving, the cheerness of the spirit to whom you have been consecrated, the one who will sanctify you, it begins to wake up in you. You feel like, uh -uh, I won't run from behind. Am I preaching to somebody this morning? I have come to stand on the word of the servant of God to break the burden of giving up on your life so you can enter true consecration. I'm done. Now go give, but give burden free. I say, go give burden free. Go give burden free. Don't get mad at her. Just go give burden free. And give burden free. Because when there's a burden on you, it tied down your pocket. You give two dollars. Because the burden is controlling everything. The fear is controlling everything. But the man and a woman, consecrated, who wake up to the reality of such a great salvation, cannot hold anything back away from Christ. Thank you, Father. Dig in your pockets. Corona or not, Macedonian church was a real poor one. The Bible said they were so poor, their poverty was the bottom of the sea. In other words, you couldn't be more poor than that. You're still eating burger. Bring my pulpit. Thank you. Thank you. So those who are watching, give. Give burden free. Because you are consecrated to the Lord. Thank you, Father. We'll talk some more about those things in the weeks and months to come.
Hallelujah. If somebody is glad to be saved today, if somebody is glad to be sanctified by God, if somebody is happy that Jesus Christ remembered you, if somebody is glad to be sitting in the heavenly places right now, in Jesus' name, give a clap offering to the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 to 26, to run with time. Thank you, Lord. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Somebody said by faith. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ. You understand Moses is in the Old Testament, true or not? But then he has the revelation of the Christ already. Are you catching this? He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking ahead to this great reward. This morning I would like to talk always in our Christ realities, a Christ-centered life. Colossians said that in all things it might have preeminence in your life. Not a part of your life. Sometimes you will hear people say, you know, God is a part of this my life is a part of my life. God doesn't want to be a part of your life. He is your life. God is not interested to be a part of your life. Are you hearing me? He is your life. So we don't need to chip in God when we want and to chip him out when he's not very comfortable and give him room when we are nice. No, no, no. If you are alive today, the only life that you have that you live is Christ's life. It's not your life, then Christ is in the middle somewhere there at 80%. When I read this text from the book of Hebrews chapter 11, I was so challenged. I like to let the scripture read me and look within me. I was too challenged. Moses considered the suffering, the rejection, and the persecution as greater, more precious than all the treasures of Egypt. This boy knew nothing but Egypt. He knew nothing than to eat nice and have slaves running around left and right for him. Moses never endured any suffering in his life when it's come to material needs. He was a prince. He never had a job like you and I or running left and right to labor. Never. When he became conscious, he was sleeping in his own bed already. He was in the greatest universities already. He was a heir to the throne. This boy did not know hardship. Then one day he wakes up by the word of God. And then he decides to relinquish all this wealth. All the stability. The privileges. The riches. The treasures, the throne, he said, no, I don't want this anymore. Because he heard a voice. Because the Bible says it's by faith. Am I right? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by what? By hearing. Hearing what? The word of God. In number word, Moses heard the message of Christ. Maybe for a vision, maybe for a dream, I don't know. But he couldn't have faith without hearing the word. Faith is not coming because you are meaning well. Faith is an encounter with the word of God 
that the only substance that can build faith. Magadosha. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So if Moses by faith could quit all these wealthy, rich treasures of Egypt, and he didn't just quit, he quit then he bought into suffering. What kind of dude is this? Seriously? You quit the easiness of life. The very thing that the whole world and you and I, we are chasing after. Big account in the bank, debt free, having few houses, real estate is blooming left and right. You understand? He quit all that stuff and he just didn't sit still. He bought into a cause of suffering. Many churches are full because they tell them you will not suffer. You come to Jesus Christ, the suffering is over. So come, we will give you the five point how to become a wealthy man. Three point how to make it. Hallelujah, I love that. Give me my three point. Then I don't need God in my life. I need him whenever I want the points. But Moses has it all. But he relinquished it all. He despised it all because he heard a voice. And that voice was potent to build faith in him to be able to live and to join into suffering. Why are you here? Why are we walking with Christ? So we can have an easy life. That when coronavirus show up, we give up on love on God. We stop worshiping him because we are going through some real tribulation. Baby, you don't know tribulation. This is no tribulation at all. You are sitting at home, they are sending you $2,000. What tribulation is that? I'm preaching this morning. No, you tell me. What tribulation is that? You have a small business, they want to give you 40000 What's the tribulation? What tribulation? You don't know tribulation. Then people stop coming to church. It becomes their best excuse now not to show up to church. Because this tribulation you call, there is none of a tribulation. It just reveals your heart. Crisis has opportunity to reveal people's hearts. Then you really know where you are at with God. You really know where you are at with the service of God. You really know where you are at with the ministry of God. You really know where you are with the worship of God. You really know where you are with the faith. You just reveal it. It's in hot water that you recognize the color of the teeth. Moses relinquished it all. By faith, he did it. Today when we talk about faith, I have faith and I get the house. I had faith and I got the new car. And I have faith and I have this. This one here, the faith for Moses was not to acquire. It was to give up on what he had. Have you ever seen such a faith? Have you ever seen people running and testifying about the faith that rose within them and they gave up on all the wealth of the world? No, no, no. On the contrary, it's when we gather it to ourselves, we say this. I have faith, I gather this. I have faith, I gather more. I have faith and then I climb up. I have faith and there are more treasures. Moses has faith until he look at the treasure and he said, nonsense, I'm not in this. I'd rather commune in suffering because of the hope and the reward that is set before me. That's faith. That is faith. Magadobasha. People want to be rewarded and they don't give up on anything. They want to be rewarded, but their faith was not expressed for them to re they release themselves from all these nice things from the treasures of the world. What is that? Hallelujah. Not only abandon the recompense of the world, but he joined in the suffering. Moses said, even if I have to go through the desert for 40 years and suffer without drinking water and walking in the hot desert, it's okay. 
This is a faith that has a price connected to it. It's called sacrifice. We're just talking about giving. Sacrifice is a language in the spirit. The blood of Abel speaks of better things. No. The blood of Jesus speaks of better things than the blood of Abel. In other words, the sacrifice of Abel was a voice in the spirit. The sacrifice of Christ is a voice in the spirit. It's a voice of no condemnation. It is the voice of redemption. It is the voice of reconciliation. And it's a voice of glorification. Sacrifice is a mark in the spirit. I come this morning to challenge you. Don't let the suffering of Christ be in vain. Moses says, fulfilling the destiny and the purpose that God has for me is more important than the treasure of Egypt. I have heard a voice. My faith was born from the voice that I heard Moses speaking. Because it's by faith. I have a journey. I have a destiny. I have a purpose to fulfill. There is a mandate for which God has brought me forth and you. Regardless of the price that must be paid. By faith. Because of the voice I heard. There is a faith that was born within me. I am ready to give up on everything. The treasures of Egypt and walk in the wilderness and suffer. Suffer. That word does not exist in many pulpits. What do you mean suffering? For what? We don't want to suffer. Is by faith Moses sacrificed. He died to the treasure. And he awakened to the promise and the reward of God. What are you struggling with? What is making you reduce your pace in serving God? What's making you reduce your pace in standing in the faith? In this season, what you need is the word of God. When I say the word of God, I'm not talking about to motivate you. By telling you, you know what, you have a dream in your heart. Donald Trump fulfilled his dream. Warren Buffett fulfilled his dream. And then everybody ran to the pulpit because there's a promise of a treasure. Everyone I'm going to gain some money. Everybody want to gain some stuff. So they all run in the front and they recite a prayer and they are not saved at the end of the day because they never heard the gospel. We will not run in the front when you tell me you have a dream in your heart and, uh, you know, Bill Gates has one also and then he fulfill it. Jesus now, come to Jesus if you want to fulfill your dream. Everybody will run. Everybody will come in the front now and recite a prayer and go home dead still. What we need is the word of God. It is to refocus everything on Christ and his finished work. Moses heard the message of the gospel. That's what he wrote by faith. And he acquainted and identified himself to what he heard. Because in the gospel he heard, he heard that the Christ will suffer. So Moses said, okay, I can acquaint and identify myself to his suffering. Put one last verse there for me. We'll continue the second service. Luke chapter 7, 22 to 28. I want me to read this portion of scripture very well. It's a long one. 
This is the account of John the Baptist. He is in the dungeon of uh, the Roman Empire. The guy is in jail, if you put it that way. But there's no plasma TV in his jail. He's really in real jail. He has no right. They can decide any time to put him down. Now, our friend John the Baptist now is feeling a little weak, like the church right now. The church of God around the world, they're feeling a little weak. Uh, are you catching what I'm saying? Yeah. Their passion and their devotion is going to look warm. What the heck is that? Just like in the prison. John the Baptist was on fire before talking to the Pharisees. You brood of vipers. And now the guy is going to his disciple. This is the man who taught his disciple to pray so powerfully. Until the disciple of Jesus envy and jealous the disciple of John the Baptist. So much this man was as the spirit of Elijah. A spirit of prayer. That he, he, taught, he taught his disciple to shandalize, to pump in the spirit. Until the Jesus disciple said, Lord, can you also teach us to pray as John taught his own disciples? This man was not like a normal person. Now he's in a weak place. He's going through a crisis. And then he sent his disciple to go ask Jesus. He said, are you the one we've been waiting for? That's exactly his asking. Or should we be looking for number one? Because this one we are waiting for is power. He come to tear down the Roman Empire down and deliver the people of Israel. Are you the one Isaiah was talking about? Now, then Jesus now responds to the messengers. Watch this. Then he told John's disciples, go back to John. And tell him what you have seen and heard. Now understand that John knew the Old Testament. He knew the Old Testament. He studied the Old Testament. John understood Isaiah. He said, tell this to him. The blind see, the lame walk, the leper are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life. And the good news is being preached to the poor. You know what? Jesus just gave him the agenda of the Messiah. Based on scripture from Isaiah. He just sent John messengers, not just with a motivation speech. He sent John messenger back to John with the word. This is the gospel. He sent him with the word. Verse 24. After John disciple left, keep this. Jesus did not begin to say what I'm going to read when John disciple was there. Because he didn't want John disciple to hear this. He literally waited when they were far off, the King James said. When they were far off, then he began to say these words. He said, Jesus began talking about him, John the Baptist, to the crowds, not to the disciples, not to the messengers. What kind of man did you go into the wilderness to see? Was he a weak reed, swayed by every breath of wind? Of course, the answer is no. Or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? No. People wear beautiful clothes and live in luxury are found in the palaces. John the Baptist was in the wilderness. Were you looking for a prophet? Now I tell them the answer. I say, yeah. And he's more than a prophet. Mm -hmm. John is the man to whom the scriptures referred when they said, look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you and he will prepare your way before you. I tell you, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John. Now, this will be a great motivation. Imagine the disciple of John, the messenger have heard this. They will go back to John and say, Rabbi John, wow, Jesus tell you to motivate, he give us a word. He gave us a message that you are the greatest among man that have been born. 
You are the first in the world. I mean, John will feel like, whoa, glory to God. Hallelujah. I feel motivated right now. I feel inspired. And John will be excited. Am I right? But five days, he will send them again for another motivation word. That's what the church is. Because as long as it's a motivation word to tell you how big you are, how phenomenal you are, how fantastic you are, how awesome you are, you will have to come back again after two days because it will fade away. So Jesus understood what John need is not a motivation message. So I will let the messenger go away. If not, if they hear this, they will throw the word and they will capture the motivation. They will throw the word and they will capture this prophetic little thing. What John needed was the word. He said, go tell him the gospel is preached. The lame are healed. The dead are raised. In other words, John, hold on tight. You didn't miss it. I'm the real deal. As Isaiah said, remember? You study Isaiah. You know what Isaiah said about me. The dead have been raised. The gospel has been preached to the world. John received greater than a motivation speech. When God heard the word, his matter was settled. Cut my head if you want. John understood by the word that he did not miss it. He has fulfilled the agenda of God. It is a greater pleasure to know that you are fulfilling God's will. No matter how much the suffering will be big. It is a great satisfaction to know, regardless of the odds, the obstacles, the opposition, the wrestling and the fighting, I am fulfilling the pleasing will of God. So cut my head. What do I need was the words. And that's what Jesus sent to John. Don't think he didn't care about John. He knew John. What he needed was a reminding of the fulfillment of the promise, the word of God. Gospel has been preached. John, Isaiah told you, this thing will be only me who does it. So it's been done. Most people today will be depressed. Tell me a specific, specific and encouraging word that will motivate me. Don't tell me this word. Don't tell me. Don't tell me the dead have been raised. Don't tell me the gospel has been preached. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. Tell me something more special. About me. Uh-huh. You understand? That's why you run and give your money to prophets. Because they don't give you the word. They tell you what you want to hear. They tickle your ears. And therefore, it is fading away after every two days. That's why you need a bigger prophet. And a, a super bigger prophet. And an extra bigger prophet every time. Because you are never satisfied. No motivation will satisfy you. Only the living word of God will satisfy you. Hallelujah. There is no satisfaction in kissing, hugging you, and telling you you are the most powerful person. I see you changing India. No, you will be happy for one month. And then when you don't hear another word, you run after another prophet. This one fade away. I need another one. Oh, I need another one. I need another one. This one, if John have heard this nice word, of any man born of a woman, there is no one greater than John. John will be happy, but when they bring the knife to cut his head, he will cream and say, oh, no, 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 I'm denying. I'm running away from Jesus. The word. That's where faith is born. Faith come by hearing. John heard the word, and his faith was built to stand being beheaded. Moses heard the word, and he was empowered to abandon all the wealth of treasures of Egypt. And to stand and commune in the suffering with the people of God. And fulfill his agenda to the pleasure of God. Is the word in. Last verse. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2. Stand up on your feet. Thank you Father. We do this by speaking our eyes. By keeping our eyes on Jesus. Did you hear this? On who? Where do we keep our eyes, friends? On Jesus. Not on men. On Jesus. 
Don't get into debates. It's a distraction. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Last week, God spoke to me in a very terrible way. When I say terrible, it means awesome. I was standing preparing to go do a recording. And suddenly, my eyes were open. You know why my eyes were open? Because somebody was speaking against me. And it hurt really my feelings. And I felt like I can go and put my nose to the nose without kissing them and smack them in the head. I wanted to go in the mood of justification and explanation. And suddenly my eyes were open. I'm telling you, and I saw a man. Listen very carefully to this and those who are watching. This man was on the track running. And people were boo, 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 boo. Insulting, dishonoring, mocking. And he kept running. And it got louder and louder. And suddenly he stopped from the track. And he walked in the tribunes. He walked where the crowd is. To go and make his case clear. To go and justify and debate and discuss. And God spoke to me. And he said, many of my people, and don't fall in that trap, talking to me. No one can stop you to achieve as long as you stay on the track. But if you move from the track and go in the tribune and begin to try to explain yourself and re-explain yourself and debate yourself and re-debate yourself, no matter how great of a runner you are, you have lost the race. I come this morning to tell you, get out of the tribunes. Get out of the tribune of justification. Get out of the tribune of explanation. Get out of the tribune of people dishonoring you, mocking you, insulting you, cheating you off. Let them boo you. But as long as you are on the track, running the race as Paul ran the race. Run the race. They are screaming there in the crowd. You are going to nothing. You are going nowhere. They are insulting you. They are opposing you. They are criticizing you. Don't stop and go up there. Come down from there. Just keep running. They can say what they want, but they cannot stop you from running. As long as you stay on the cross, as long as you stay on the track, as long as you keep your eyes on the goal, Haribosa, Jesus Christ, let them make the noise. Very soon they will begin to applause. But if you stop and go back to deal with it, you've been taken away from your track. In Jesus' name, you will not. I say you are coming down from the tribunes. This life is not philosophy. We are here dealing with eternal matters. No matter who likes you or who doesn't like you, at the end, in the confines of eternity, is nada. Is nil. No matter who was for you or who's not for you. No matter. I tell you the truth. In the confines of eternity, a lot of things that we measure here, it is zero. What is the name of this great British revivalist from Wales? An evangelist. His wife used to kick him when he's praying. Kick him. I mean, beat the guy up. He stood on the cross. And he awakened the nation for Christ. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the suffering. He endured the shame. He despised the shame. He despised the dishonor. I want to give you the key that I uncover lately. That make me a champion from within. You know what it is? Despise all the nonsense. Okay, let's keep reading. Please, leave. I like myself, but I really like to have the verse more than me. <laughs> it is true. He's a good looking guy, isn't he? Okay, leave it there. Because of the joy awaiting him. No, no, no. 
he, he, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiate and perfect this, our faith. Leave that out. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. Disregarding. Disregarding. Can you disregard few things? Can you disregard two things? My boss didn't like me. Who cares? Is he paying you? Yes. Take the money and be happy. Give your tithe and serve God. <laughs> disregarding. Disregarding the nonsense. Who's clapping for you? Who's insulting you? Disregard it. In another word, mean, consider as if it never existed. Brother and sister, we talk about eternal things. All right? A hug does not have any impact in eternity. I tell you the truth. The car you drive is nonsense. It doesn't have any impact. The house in which you live, seriously, it has no impact. You understand what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Who tell you that you're good looking or not? It doesn't have any impact. It depends on what you give as, what is your perspective? Depends on what, the way you give to what people say. But Jesus, he disregarded the shame. He disregarded the shame. And because of that, he was elevated sitting in the place of what? Honor. What does it profit you to gain the world and lose the race? What does it profit you to go back in the tribune and discuss and lose the race? Jesus came for that very reason. To die for your sins and mine. When we are still sinners, he gave his life. The wages of sin is death. No doctor can remove that sin from you. It's a nature. And because of God, purity and holiness, you will become separated, becoming an enemy with him. But God so loved you that he sent Jesus, the Lamb of God, spotless, sinless, to take your place. That's the gospel. According to the scriptures, he died on the cross, stretched his hand, and he saw the joy of your salvation. He saw that you will be saved today. He saw you will have the revelation of the glory and the eternal plan of God for you. And because of that, he endured it. He endured it. He was burned. He was, he was buried, according to the scripture. And he rose on the third day, sitting at the right hand of the Father. If today you call upon your name, the name of the Lord, you also shall be saved. Your sins shall be forgiven. You will be reconciled back to the Father. If you are listening to this broadcast, if you are listening to this service, and the Spirit of God is ministering to you because the Word of God gives life and it is spirit. And you want to take that step to say, I want to live for Jesus Christ by his life. I want to be reconciled to the Father. All you need to do is to shake the hand of God through the sacrifice of Christ. And how do you do that? You just pray a simple prayer as you believe in your heart the message of the good news. Pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you suffered for me. That you took my place. And you paid the price. You died in my place. And you rose again. To reconcile me to the Father. I appreciate you. Thank you for doing that for me. And today, I want to take advantage. To be reconciled to God. To have an eternal peace. An eternal relationship. With my creator. And my maker. I receive you. In my heart. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hands, can we give a clap to the Lord? If it's your first time you make this prayer and you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, find a Bible-believing church where they preach Christ. No philosophy, no motivation. Jesus Christ. And if you live in this neighborhood, come and join us here at Crosspoint. We'll be glad to welcome you. Join this great family of believers who have chosen to keep their eyes on Jesus. Hallelujah, somebody. Can we celebrate him, people of God? Let's give him thanks for such a great salvation. Thank you, Father. To you be the glory. To you be the honor. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for forgiveness of sin. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for the peace right now. Thank you for separating us from our sin. Thank you for the gift of righteousness. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Thank you, Father! We love you! We love you! May the Lord bless you richly. 
church of God and you may be released and see you on Wednesday online with our midweek Bible study and Sunday same place same time to glorify the Father hallelujah God bless you we love you